What is the most important journal paper published in chemistry during your lifetime? I have no idea. Um, there are a number of papers which I think are obviously very landmark papers. I suppose the first in my lifetime that was really, or in my scientific lifetime, was the fact that xenon could react with fluorine, or PTF6, which really caused a big shift in people's thinking. I think the publication of the paper about C60, the molecule buckyballs, also changed people's thinking quite a lot. But many of these key papers in chemistry have been, once the, the people have understood them, they become almost obvious. But I think if I should be honest, and this was a paper that was published in 1952, so when I was four and a half years old, so it was before my scientific lifetime, I would say probably the most important paper was the paper by Crick and Watson about the structure of DNA, in the sense it gave us more understanding about the mechanism of life and ideas on hereditary, how to cure diseases and so on than anything else. But I can't say that I really took it in, though I can remember as a teenager reading a newspaper article about the structure of DNA. It was probably when Crick and Watson got their Nobel Prize in the early 60s, and I got really excited about that and told my father that this is what I wanted to do when I grew up. How do we know the shape and arrangement of complex molecules? The most obvious way is by using X-ray crystallography, which can tell you the position of atoms in molecules. It can't tell you whether they're bonded together or not, but it, because that depends on the electrons, but it can tell you where one atom is relative to another. Next year, 2014, is the International Year of Crystallography, and so we'll probably be doing several videos about it then, so keep watching for that. The most exciting development is a technique called scanning tunneling microscopy, where by moving a tip, a very sharp tip across a surface, you can actually feel the shape of a molecule, rather like somebody who's blind can feel the shape of something on the table even though they can't see it. And that is revealing the shapes of molecules in really quite a lot of detail. And perhaps that's the most unexpected development in the whole of my scientific career, the idea that you can actually image molecules. Why did you choose chemistry over the other sciences when you were in high school or college? I'm ashamed to say that I only had one school term, which is about eight weeks of biology in the whole of my career. And looking back on it, it's much more what would now be called nature study than modern biology. I then studied chemistry and physics, and my father and grandfather were physicists. So I wanted to become a physicist. I wasn't good enough at maths. I had a near photographic memory as a child, so learning chemistry was very easy. I was, must have been a pupil for, from hell for my chemistry teacher. I talked to my friends all the time in the class, but I could answer every question like that, except once. And I've never seen a bigger smile on the face of a teacher than that. Do you remember what the question was? No. <laughs> That one didn't get photographed. <laughs> what is one discovery that you think will come after your lifetime and how will it change our lives? That's a very interesting question. And the answer is that if we could predict what the discovery would be, it probably wouldn't change our lives all that much. A lot is made of quantum computing, which people now in theory knows what it should do, but in practice have are moving towards it but haven't got very far. What might happen even in my lifetime is the manufacturing of synthetic organisms, so-called synthetic biology, in which one could create bacteria 
And this could transform the way that we make chemicals because you can make a bacterium which within reason could convert this compound into that one. You'll never make a bacterium that can convert lead into gold, but you could one organic compound into another. What is the highest possible atomic number for an element? If you work for the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, they'd answer 999 because they worked out a system for naming elements up to 999. I think the answer is that these elements become more and more unstable as you go up. There's still some argument whether elements 119, 120 will be synthesized anytime soon. There is some suggestion that there will be so-called islands of stability. That is, you go through a lot of unstable elements and then you will come to some really stable elements. And quite a long time ago, nearly 40 years ago, somebody published a paper in which they looked at some mineral called mica. That's the one that comes in sheets, rather like sheets of glass, and found some strange spots which they interpreted as the decay of super heavy elements. Everyone got really excited. Turned out to be rubbish. How has the introduction of computers changed the way you think about or do chemistry? When our department, I wasn't working here, got the first computer that people, ordinary users, could use and program, I thought it was a bit boring and didn't want to use it. But then I found that I could predict the spectrum of the molecules that I was making, and I got really hooked. I spent a thousand minutes a week of computing time. That was the limit. And the computer terminal sort of chugged away in a little um, conservatory in the department, and I would go and visit it every few minutes. It's been enormously important, I think, in the way that people publish chemistry. Very few people now have paper copies of journals. They publish everything um, electronically, get them down as PDF files. And it's also had a huge effect with people collaborating via um, instant messaging, via email, and so on, so that one can talk to somebody on the other side of the world and do an experiment together. As a chemist, what motivates you to keep going? Doing research is, to some extent, almost like an addiction you keep on needing more and more to keep going. I suppose that the reason I really keep going is because I enjoy it and because nature, that is what's around us rather than the journal nature, is so fascinating because even quite boring experiments can turn out to be really exciting. And everything that we discover about nature is cleverer than we expect. And what's your biggest disappointment? I'm not sure what my biggest disappointment is. I think scientists tend to live in the present. It's difficult to say. I have a friend who worked in industry who did some experiments with evaporating carbon and produced a red solution, which we now know is C60. But he didn't have time to analyze it because his industrial job required something else. So he could have discovered C60 long before other people. I don't think in my career I feel that I have overlooked various things. I suppose there are a number of occasions where I've said an idea was stupid and then somebody else has gone and done it and shown that it works. But in that case, I think one can just laugh and say, well, they're brighter than me, and be pleased that they've got the thing to work. What is your proudest scientific achievement and why? I think one really gets quite excited about whatever is the current experiment you're doing. There are one or two things which I have done which are not big achievements, but I think without being arrogant, that I, I was quite clever to think of them, even though the actual idea was not of enormous importance. Many years ago, 
my professor took a sabbatical year. He took a whole term off to do experiments. And he worked really hard, but he couldn't understand his results. And I came and sat on the um, lab stool next to him and made a suggestion which explained everything. And, of course, I felt quite clever. It turns out that the experiment was of very little importance. I doubt if anybody has read the paper about it for nearly 40 years, but I still feel quite pleased about that. I think, in the end, people like me, senior scientists, are a bit like parents. And the thing that really makes me proud is when I see my former students, my former postdocs, doing really well in science, getting prizes, becoming professors themselves. And that, I suppose, is in some ways by far the biggest reward for being a scientist that I learnt from terrific scientists before me, and I've been able to pass at least a bit of that on to future generations. And perhaps through these videos, I can pass a little bit on just to you. Lovely.